We've been in this series called Unearned for the past two months. Pastor Jason started us off with unnatural grace. He told this story about a time he was a child and he received this trophy that he did not deserve and he threw it in the trash. Pastor Drew shared a story about a friend who went to college and there was a student there who received an A on this very difficult test. And all he did was simply write, grace is me getting an A on this test, even though I deserve an F. We've learned different ideas of grace. We've learned about the identity of grace, sanctifying grace, pursuing grace. And last week we learned about feeling grace. I I mean, freeing grace. Some of you won't get that. But for the past seven weeks, We've looked at how to receive grace. Today, I'm going to wrap up this series with extending grace. We're going to look at how we can use all that we've learned over the past two months, all of the grace that we've been given to extend it to others. What does it look like for us to extend grace to others? When I first became a believer, it was back in high school in 1996, I didn't have much church exposure. I wasn't raised in the church, although every once in a while my family would go to church on Christmas, maybe Easter, um, every once in a while. But after becoming a follower of Jesus, I was introduced to a lot of new words. It was like I had to learn this new language. It was Christianese. Words that I had never heard before or had no idea what they meant. Words like Gentile, eunuch, sanctification, justification, repentance, disciple, tribulation, salvation, mercy, and grace. I did hear the last two words before, mercy and grace, but I had no idea how to define them. I specifically remember, though, this idea of grace. I was asking someone, what does grace actually mean? You've probably heard this before. They said, God riches at Christ's expense. And I thought, wow, that explains it. Thank you. That's cute. I had no idea what that meant. It took me years to realize the true meaning of grace. So today, our source text is going to be coming from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. While in prison, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to Christ followers in Ephesus. It was probably passed around to all the other churches in the areas like most of his letters were. This book of Ephesians can be broken into pretty much two different parts. Chapters 1 through 3 address the gospel story, specifically how Gentiles and Jews are now united in Christ as a new covenant family. How the church is also made up of this multi-ethnic family of new humans. New and unity are major themes that run throughout this entire letter. Chapters 4 through 6 address our story. How the gospel story should reshape every part of the church as individuals and as a collective whole. Paul adds God's Holy Spirit into the mix as one who can unite this mashup of people into a new humanity called the ecclesia, which is a word that was used to describe a political assembly of citizens in ancient Greek states. So the word typically gets translated as the church in the New Testament, which I think is fitting since the church is an assembly of citizens in the kingdom of God. Hold on to that thought, and hopefully we'll get back to that. So Ephesians 4 reads, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Paul urges believers to conduct themselves in a manner that is consistent with and honors God and his divine purpose for the church. 
He then lays out how to live a worthy life with these three graces. And they're all wrapped up in love. He uses the word humility, gentleness, and patience. So the next few minutes, we're going to run through these really quickly to hopefully get a better idea of what he's talking about. So first one is humility. Paul urges believers to live in humility. I know these days, humility or being humble gets a bad rap. When someone mentions mentions humility, we tend to think of weakness. Some would think of it as thinking less of oneself. But in reality, it's thinking of oneself less. You see that difference? Thinking less of oneself or thinking of oneself less. Slight change, but a huge difference. Paul gives us an idea of what humility is not in his letter to the Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. So what does it mean to be humble? I think it's being other, others focused and being considerate, looking after others. If you consider others better than yourself, then you're going to have to give up some of your rights. Don't get me wrong here. Paul is not telling us that we are to let people walk all over us. Putting others before yourself is not letting people walk over you or getting burnt out or becoming this doormat. See, extending grace does not always require reconciliation. You're not just giving someone this free pass to do whatever. We still need to set up healthy boundaries, emotional and physical. And remember, though, This is the Spirit's work. He has our best interest in mind. This isn't easy to live out. It's supernatural. Paul urges believers to be humble and gentle. Gentleness is like peacefulness. It's not being at the beach, relaxing type of peacefulness. And some people sometimes think that peace is the absence of conflict. It is that, but a whole bunch more. Biblical peace, or shalom, is referring to wholeness and completeness. It's working together for each other's benefit. It's agreeing wholeheartedly and working together with one purpose and one mind. It's taking that broken, that brokenness and restoring it to harmony and wholeness. If you've ever been a part of a sports team or any kind of team, you've probably seen this happen, where this group seems to move as one. You can sometimes see this in sports when other teams have been together for years. There's this unity that's mind-boggling. But if that same team has one person who thinks they're better than everyone else, and they're looking out to make a name for themselves, this unity gets fractured. Patience. Paul is urging believers to walk humbly and in gentleness with patience. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. There's another another translation that puts it this way. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. See that? Making allowance for each other's faults. Now, the church is full of people, and people are full of faults. We belong to this one family of God, and we must learn how to bear with each other. If you've got kids, you might understand it a little bit better this way. I have three teenagers, two girls and a boy. 
here's an in interesting side note. My uh, wife's name, her middle name is Joy. And she started using that name more often when we go out or when she gets coffee because it's much easier to hear Joy, party of five, than Karen, party of five these days. So she's been working with teenagers and kids, and she's had to put this disclaimer to her name. She says, my name is Karen, but I'm not a Karen. It's been fun. That was a rabbit trail, so let's get back to this side note. I have three teenagers, and my wife's middle name is Joy. When we were picking a name for our firstborn, we thought it might be cool if we named him Peace, because hers Joy Peace. We thought, okay, yeah, let's do that. So we named him Josiah Peace Vincent. And when our second born came, we still wanted to play with us a little bit. So we thought Love would be a good middle name. So we named her Aaliyah Love Vincent. Our third child came. We're running out of these descriptors of the fruit of the Spirit. So we looking and struggling, and then we came up with patience. So we have Ava Patience Vincent. And so now we have in our family, our middle names are love, joy, peace, patience. And then people will ask what my middle name is. And I'm like, Dean. Yeah, it's, uh, I wish my parents would have had the foresight to name me kindness. Then we would be an awesome collective family. Anyway, back to this point. Patience. One thing that makes my day is when I see my kids working together, when they're getting along, when they're patient with each other, they're making these allowance for each other's faults. When there's a spirit of unity, it feels great when I see them loving one another, looking out for each other. It's just awesome. But it's frustrating seeing them attacking each other, backbiting, being selfish, only looking out for themselves. It makes me sad when they put up these walls of disunity and fight with each other. And then it makes me really wonder, how does God feel when he sees the church, his children, behaving like this? I'm not just talking about the big C church, also the little C church the different individual congregations. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace, working together with one mind and purpose, being patient with each other, making allowance for each other's own faults because of your love. As I mentioned earlier, I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't hear the gospel message until I was 19 years old, senior in high school. There was this classmate named Steve who came, and he sat next to me in one of my classes. Um, I didn't really know Steve. I knew of him, but I didn't know him personally. I knew he was a Christian and that he wasn't wrapped up in all of the mess that me and my friends were in. Um, Steve ex extended grace to me. He started sharing different things with me about the Bible, stuff I had never heard, stuff that was blowing my mind. I didn't have any idea of this stuff. He started out, though, very simple. He, he asked me, did you know that in the Bible, the donkey spoke? No, I don't believe that. He's like, yeah, really? In the Bible, a donkey spoke. Turned to the passage and showed me where a donkey spoke. And he continued to pour into me. One day, he made a copy of this tape. It's back in the 90s. He made a copy of a tape called the Gospel Gangsters, Gangsters. He gave it to me, and I was into rap. I was born and raised in Tulsa, been listening to rap since third grade. Um, the rap I was listening to then was not glorifying God in any way. But he gives me this tape, and I'm starting to listen to it. I'm listening to these different biblical truths. The Holy Spirit started convicting me of some of the things I was doing started drawing me to himself. And then he had been with me for, uh, talking with me for about seven months. He was never forceful. He never tried to push his beliefs 
on me. He didn't try to get me to come to his church. He just patiently spoke life into me. He was humble in spirit. He didn't come off like he knew everything. He was gentle and he made me feel like I belonged. So seven months, he extended grace. And then one day he wrote out this letter and he quoted Romans 10, 9 through 10. When I got home, I read the letter and the scripture. My life has not been the same since then. Romans 10, 9, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it's openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Why did Steve do this? He was like ex extending the same love that he had received from God. He wasn't raised in the church, but he was living out the fruit of the Spirit. By now, you might be thinking that these three graces we've been talking about, humility, gentleness, and patience, sound like the fruit of the Spirit, and they are. But have you ever wondered why the Apostle Paul, as he's writing this letter, he quotes the fruit of the Spirit, and he says, fruit of the Spirit in singular, but he lists out nine different attributes, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's difficult to describe something if you don't have a specific word or vocabulary for it. So Paul couldn't find just one word in the Greek language to describe the concept of the fruit of the Spirit. So he uses nine. This list of attributes define the character of one being led by the Spirit of God. And this list is not exhaustive. It seems like this, that the Spirit produces love in a believer. The other eight are graces that reveal the richness of this love. I saw this uh, quote, thought it was very interesting. Love is the key, so love is the fruit. Joy is love singing. Peace is love resting. Patience is love enduring. Kindness is love sharing. Goodness is love's character. Faithfulness is love's habit. Gentleness is love's touch. And self-control is love in charge. The fruit of the Spirit produces in us these characteristics that are cultivated and grown in the presence of God. Better yet, is by allowing God's Spirit to take residence in us. We're being built together to become a dwelling place for God to live by His Spirit. So we're saved by grace alone. But we have to welcome God's Spirit in us to work. He produces this fruit in us. We have to maintain connected to Him. If you don't see fruit in your life, this fruit the Spirit produces in your life, ask Him. Ask the Spirit, give me this fruit. Cultivate this fruit in me. Submit to His leading and not giving in to your own desires. If you remember back when we were in the I Am series, Pastor Ed had talked about abiding in the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So fruit comes from us abiding in the vine. Abiding is a continual connection with God. When we remain in the vine, the Spirit produces fruit in us. These are the characteristics of grace. So I think extending grace is living out the fruit of the Spirit. Extending grace is living out the fruit of the Spirit. The, root, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and it's wrapped in these eight graces. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So I'm going to read this definition 
uh, that the Apostle Paul wrote back in 1 Corinthians 13. This is the ultimate wedding passage. So if you would close your eyes and listen as I read this aloud. 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. I don't know about you, but I fall short. When I read this list, I know I don't act in love all the time if I ever do completely. That's the good news. That's grace. God working in us to produce this fruit of the Spirit. Also, extending grace is showing love. What is love? We just read it. Jesus knew humanity, the church, or the ecclesia, is called into partnership with God through unity in the Spirit. It's something that the Spirit establishes, but believers must maintain. So hopefully throughout this series, you've been given the tools to better understand and receive God's amazing grace. So for us to extend grace, we must first receive it. One thing that we need to remember is that grace is always played out in relationships, vertically and horizontally, with God and with others. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the commandments hang on these two laws. So also, extending grace is an act of worship. It's a response to the marvelous work that God has done through Christ Jesus, our Lord. What would it look like if Christians actually lived this out? Not non-believers, just those who label themselves Christian. Think about it. If one person in your family was always humble and peaceful, patient, agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose, not selfish or trying to impress others, living in humility by thinking of others better than themselves, looking out for the interest of others. I think it would be amazing to see that. If our family did that, it would be completely different if we put others first. What if you were that one person in your family? What kind of change would that bring? What would it look like in your school if you brought this? You lived in humility, thinking of others as better than yourself. You see the guy sitting over there at lunch by himself, and you think of him as better than yourself, and you go sit with him, ask how he's doing. What about your workplace? What would that look like if you weren't selfish? Husbands and dads, what would that look like? What would be different in your home if you are patient, making room for each other's faults? We all have faults. Wives and moms, would your home be any different if you extended grace? If all believers put this into practice and were extending grace, what would that look like? What would family church look like if we all extended grace to one another? What would Roseburg look like if just all Christians in family church were to extend grace to everyone? What would that look like in Douglas County, in Oregon, the United States, or even the world? It would look like the kingdom of God had come to earth. It's already here, but not yet. The kingdom is here, but not fully. 
And so that's one thing that God is calling us as believers to do, extending grace to others, bringing his kingdom here and living by that, by walking in the spirit. I'm going to close uh, just reading Ephesians 4 again. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourself with peace. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ Jesus. I'm going to release to the campuses. Thank you all and have a great week. Thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, it's time for our transformational moment. Here's my challenge to you. Pick one person that you can extend grace to this week. Think of someone, whoever you deal with in whatever circle you're in, one person that you can intentionally extend grace to. See what happens. I believe it'll be life-changing. could be life-changing for that person. could be life-changing for you. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for just all you've given us, God, all you've done for us. We thank you, God, for this series of grace. God, I pray that each one of us would understand what grace is, God, and that how you've given it to us. But God, we wouldn't just be selfish and keep it for ourselves, but we would extend it to others. We would let others see your love through us. I pray, God, that you would speak to each person, that you would give them one person to extend grace to this week, and that you would just change lives. God, that you would do your awesome work in redemption bringing peace and love. We thank you, God, for all your gifts and ask that you would just watch over us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. It was awesome. Have a great week.